It's incredible how snow transforms the environment, creating an almost otherworldly landscape, a winter wonderland. This is Arctic Sweden. Of course, you'd expect me to tell you that the temperatures here in winter can drop as low as minus 50 degrees Celsius. But perhaps the more significant figure is the average winter temperature, which is minus 10. That means that just to live here, you have to have a knowledge of bushcraft. What's interesting is that here in Sweden, traditional skills of bushcraft survive alongside modern outdoor skills. And the reason for that is, of course, that they work. Of course, Sweden isn't always covered in snow. I start my journey in the late autumn before the lakes are frozen over. I've been coming here for many years. One of the things that really impresses me about Sweden is the way the local people respect the natural world. They talk about the nature. And that's something I really want to explore in this program. Sweden is a long, thin country, which at its most northern point is 240 kilometers inside the Arctic Circle. But I'm starting in the south near Karlsborg, an area that I love visiting. The landscape here is typical of Sweden, which has an abundance of natural resources. There are more than 100,000 lakes, most of which have water so clean you can drink straight from them. I'm really looking forward to spending a couple of days in this area, exploring what the forests have to offer at this time of year. And in such amazing surroundings, it hasn't been difficult to find a suitable place to set up camp. Canoeing and camping in a landscape like this is the nearest thing I know to a religious experience. It's just beautiful. But at this time of year, the days are short, so you have to be, you'd have to be very conservative about what you try to achieve. And also, with the summer visitors gone, the forest is so silent. You can hear a woodpecker tapping at wood half a mile away across the lake. It really is amazing. Even though it's quite late in the year, there are still a few wild foods to be found. This grows in Scotland as well. I'm going to take some of the leaves to show you. In English, we call that the cowberry, but uh, here in Sweden they call it lingon. These are a very important wild food here in Sweden, and they once were in other parts of Europe too. And the reason for that is that they're a natural preservative. If you put these berries in water, you can store them in that way, all through the winter. In the old days, people used to add them to other fruits. In England, we used to add them to pears, sometimes to apples as well, to help preserve those fruits before we had refrigeration. In the north, these are a very popular accompaniment made into a jelly added to wild reindeer meat. It's fantastic. It's very unusual now to see any fungi because there's been quite heavy rain and rain virtually dissolves the mushrooms. But this one here, this is a, a type of hedgehog fungus, one of the sarcodons. If I turn it over, you can see there, it almost looks like deer's hair underneath, the little spines that it has. And that's also good eating. Isn't that beautiful? It does look just like deer's fur. I'm being joined by an old friend for the evening, Lars Felt, the father of survival training in Sweden. Hey, Lars. Hi, Ray. How are you? Find a place. 
Yeah, perfect. Good. There are a few rocks here, Lars. Be careful. Okay. I've known him for more than 20 years, and we've spent many memorable trips together in the wilderness. Good to see, see you. see you again. Excellent. Yeah. Would you like some coffee? Oh, please. <laughs> In Britain, in spite of the recent Right to Roam Act, there are still many places we're not allowed to go. But here in Sweden, there is an ancient right called Allemansretten, which allows almost unlimited access. Like many Swedes, Lars spends much of his free time in the countryside, taking advantage of their relaxed laws. People here, they can stay in uh, the land and uh, they can walk through the land and they don't have permission. There are some rules in national park and things like that, but normally you can go and stay one night with your tent, even in private land. What about lighting fires? Uh, it's some regulation in, uh, in summer when it's very hot, but uh, most of the year you can make fire. There isn't a mess. People don't leave tin cans and beer cans in the fireplace. Why no. is that, do you think? I think it's an old tradition in Sweden that we, it's not only right, it's also respect. I think most of the people learn that in school. And I think also the parents have responsibility. And my responsibility now is to take care of my grandchildren. You enjoy that? Oh, yeah. And how old are your grandchildren, how old are your grandchildren now, Lars? Six and one and a half. You told me just the other day that he, the young one, he's uh, almost old enough to hold a canoe paddle. Oh, yeah. The oldest, she has a little canoe paddle, and next summer he will have one. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> wow, what have you got there? This is a char, the salmon fish from the lake here. It's for you if you show me the Indian way to cook it. <laughs> <laughs> that has got to be the cheekiest way <laughs> I've ever heard of getting your dinner cooked for you. All right, you're on. Thank you. Fabulous, look at that. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that is something else, isn't it? Okay, oh, we better we better put a bit more wood on the fire, I think. Okay. The Arctic char is a type of salmon. It's highly adapted to living in freezing waters, so it can be found further north than any other freshwater fish. I've cooked it many times in many different ways, but one of my favorite ways is a method I learned from the indigenous people of Alaska. Lars is keen to see this unique way to remove all of the bones. I take my thumb and I go down to the spine, and what I want to do is I want to now ease the ribs out of the flesh with my thumb. Oh yeah. But I'm gonna go all the way along the fish, like that. That's clever. So we now, now come over the other side and use the other thumb. That's why we were given thumbs, I think. Yeah. And away we go. Out come the ribs. So there are all the bones. Yeah. I always get very disappointed now when I, <laughs> when I eat this sort of fish in a restaurant and I end up having to pick bones out on the plate. It seems <laughs> very unnecessary mm. because it's so easy to fill it. It is. Oh, that's just the right length. Okay. Excellent. Good heat too. Good heat, yeah. Lovely. Okay. We'll see. It's cooking nicely. Mm. Oh. Well, here's the moment of truth. Can you pass me the fish? Sure. Fantastic, that looks great, doesn't it? Good colour. Really good colour. Gold. If you can pull the stick out there, Lars. Yep. There we go. And um, I tell you what, earlier, just before you arrived, I collected some uh, lingon berries. Yes. And I thought maybe we'd add a few lingon berries on top of there. What do you think? A little bit of That's colour. Good. Put some of those on there. 
little accompaniment to go with that. Mm. So Lars, please. Thank enjoy. you. Mm. I like the colour. Mm. Delicious. <laughs> I'm gonna have a bit with some of these berries as well. <laughs> That's great. Mmm. Taste of the season. Perfect. I don't know, but those berries are almost like having a glass of red wine with the fish. Fantastic. Now we only need a drum of whiskey. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I didn't bring any with me. Bad preparation, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> last days of the year are a really precious time. You know, it's five o'clock and the sun has already gone down. By the end of next month, this water will have begun to freeze over. And then the canoes have to be locked up for the winter, which is a miserable experience. Now, it's a magic time. There's a vibrant colors to be drunk in. And all of a sudden, our campfire seems to leap up and say, hey, I'm important again. It's a great time to be out especially with old friends. One of the things I really love about bushcraft is learning the different uses for trees I know in other countries. Take the humble Scots pine, for example. Back in Britain, this isn't a tree we regard with the same affection as we do the oak tree. But here in Sweden, this is one of the most common trees. And they have an incredible array of uses for this truly remarkable tree. The wood from pine is soft and durable, which means it's good for carving. I've asked Bjorn Johnson, an expert at working with pine, to make me some traditional wooden skis, which I'll need as I'll be returning to Sweden in the winter. Dead wood. A dead one? Yeah, dead, dead standing. One. Dead standing. Something like that? Something like that, yeah. Are the knots a problem? Uh, could be, but the uh, thing with this one is that it's straight. It's very straight. This tree is dead standing, which means the wood is dry, but not rotten. It's a little clearer tone. Yeah, in it. More of a ring higher up, yeah. yeah. What do you think? I think that should work quite fine. Maybe that's, that's enough. I think give it a push. There she goes. Timber. Yeah. <laughs> you can see when you fell a tree, you cut in that notch to begin with which gives the tree the ability to, to start to tilt when the time comes, and you soar in above the apex of the V. The reason for this is as, as the tree tilts, it pushes against there, stops it jumping up backwards, and it falls in the right direction. Effectively, this becomes a hinge, and it falls 90 degrees to that, straight as it has. Experience. Experience. 